First item on the agenda, or second item on the agenda, is the acceptance of the minutes, which I am going to take off the agenda because we're going to be making some changes to them. We will put that back on the agenda for the next meeting. Uh, we're going to go out of order on the agenda, and we are going to take the um, uh, the extension, the six month extension. I've forgotten the address already. Four seventy five hundred five thirty Boxford Street. Good evening, Councillor. Good evening. If you, um, if, if you could just uh, just tell us what's going on, what we're looking for tonight. Sure. Really quickly, um, Attorney Brian Vaughn for um, Mike Donovan. Um, this was a, a decision that was issued, and we were granted a variance, um, and we're coming up against a one-year um, period at which the variance would expire. So, simply requesting an extension of the variance. Um, the reason for the delay, after we had the variance granted, we um, we're in front of the Conservation Commission for a number of months, um, continued a number of times. It was a lot of work put into it. But we um, finally got our approval from conservation. Um, so as a result of those delays, it, it took a bit longer to get um, to where we're at now. So um, that was the, the request with respect to the, the extension. I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, the second piece of it was going through the conservation commission process. Conservation had a number of, of issues which resulted in some minor modifications to the layout on the, um, on the plan. Um, primarily just moving um, the houses uh, very slightly um, to, to change the, the, the footprint very slightly on, on one of them. The other one actually maintained the same footprint, but on both of them, um, they wanted to bring the driveways out into the front of the homes to come straight in so that um, it, it was less impervious and impacting setbacks. Now the variance that was granted on this was uh, for CBA, so it was not dimensional. We still fully conform. It's just a matter of the original decision. Our, um, you know, there was reference to the plans that we had submitted, um, and I think the board's condition said that Substantial shall be substantially consistent with the, the plans that were submitted. Um, I think the new plans that I submitted, which take into account the changes in, in moving the garages and driveways, are in fact substantially consistent with what we had submitted. I think that they comply with the original decision, but we wanted to be, you know, full disclosure, letting you guys know what those changes were, um, and. The, again, the footprints that were on the original Mylar plan um, had changed slightly. Um, we could record the original Mylar that we, we had signed in as much as the variance itself, again, was related to CBA. It wasn't related to where the footprint lies, but we just think it makes more sense to update the Mylar with, with the um, the new footprint as it's been adjusted so that whatever is recorded will be consistent with what is ultimately built. So that's. All right. Thank you. So what I'm hearing for tonight, uh, what the, what you're seeking from the board is a six month extension. Uh -huh. And is that, uh, is six months uh, adequate time for you and your client to, to perform? Or do you think that there's going to, is there a chance that you'll be needing more time after it, the six? Six months should be, should be, um, more than sufficient because we've, the, I think the only pending approval at this point is going to be the a r plan from um, planning, which should be very quick. We have um, all of our other approvals. Okay. And that the second part of what I was hearing you say is that there are some insubstantial changes and you just want to ensure that the, the board is clear and we'll, we'll make a finding that those changes are in fact insubstantial. Uh, that's not something that we're going to do tonight. That's something that's going to need to be noticed. So I don't want, I don't want the board to, um, to, to to start thinking that they need to ask questions on that. We will certainly ex examine that at the, the next meeting if you're able to get notices out or at the, the meeting thereafter. So for tonight, 
Um, uh, all the applicant is requesting from us is an additional six months because he's been in, uh, you know, delayed in CONCOM for a number of months. Is that correct? Accurate. All right. So let me just clarify this as well: that you're only allowed a one month, a one time, six month extension. So correct. after the six months is up, you have to come in and refile a new. Right. We would have to request a new variance. A new after variance. That's so just to, for clarification. That's statutory for the A section six. Thank you. Well, you have new members. I thought I'd take uh -huh. a teaching more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I every, te <laughs> every teaching moment possible. Yes. Uh, any other questions from the board? Comments or concerns from the board? Then, with that, do we need a, a? We must need a motion for this, right? I make a motion to grant the extension as requested. Motion made and seconded. All of you do a voice vote here. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, so that's a unanimous approval. Thank you, Council. Thank you. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is the continued public hearing of AL Prime 1725 Turnpike Street. <laughs> Good evening. Mm -hmm. Since it's been a couple of months and we have a couple of new faces uh, on the on the board, it's my hope that you could just kind of tell tell us, give, do a recap. If you tell us where we've been and where we are, that would be helpful to open up. Okay. For the record, my name is Anthony Guba. I'm a registered professional engineer in the state of Massachusetts and an employee of AL Prime Energy Consultant that is the applicant for this uh, case. Uh, corporate office is currently located at 18 Lark Avenue, Saugus, Massachusetts. Um, this property is located at 1725 Turnpike Street, Route 114, on the southbound side. It is presently a gas station. It has been a gas station for decades. Um, in 1998, I believe it was approved to be uh, remodeled um, to most of what you see as a current condition. And then subsequent to that, there was another um, variance granted for the signage on the site. Presently, the site has a very small convenience store, which was the uh, building that was existing prior to AL Prime's purchase of the property in 1998. And um, that is the same uh, uh, store that's there today. Um, in a, uh, after the, the property was purchased, Prime uh, reconfigured the gas uh, pump islands out front and added a diesel uh, island under a separate canopy on the north end of the property. The property presently has two driveways. Uh, those driveways are controlled by Mass Highway, um, and um, the property is zoned commercial. One of the problems uh, that we've had with this property is that the setback requirements in this zone exceed the depth of the property, so that uh, almost anything that is done on the property requires at least some kind of special permit or variance relief in order to uh, to be able to be done on the site. What we're asking to do, uh, we feel is, is fairly minimal, is to improve the site. It's uh, been a while since any work has been done there. Uh, um, and at the time that the site was built, uh, there was no municipal sewer uh, available. So a septic system was located at the south end of the property. Um, I think to make it easy, I'll just use a pointer right here. And the building is located here, the gas islands are here, and the diesel island is here. Um, since the time that this was originally constructed or reconstructed, um, municipal sewers become available. So at this point, we'd like to eliminate the septic system and uh, relocate the building to the area where the septic system is located at the south end of the property, which is the widest and deepest part of the property. and um, increase the number of fueling positions. Uh, presently, there are uh, four dispensers on the site, counting the diesel, to uh, six dispensers on the site. Uh, the number of gas or automotive uh, fueling positions would go from the current three to five. Um, we've gone to three hearings. Uh, this is the third hearing, I should say. 
Uh, originally, we had proposed that the new building would be 2,000 square feet, and um, we have uh, we reduced that uh, at the last hearing, and uh, we further reduced it uh, as we're presenting it today. So that's it's about 20 percent less than the 2,000 to approximately 1,600 square feet presently shown. Uh, we originally show. Uh, uh, proposed a building that had a flat roof and met more of the typical AL Prime gas station, uh, but were uh, but have changed it based on the comments by the board to a building that has a more New England Nate uh, character to it with a pitched roof and that also presents to the south and to the um, west with a more residential. Uh, view to the abutting neighborhood. Um, this site is zoned commercial, but to the back corner, the southwest corner, right, this section right here um, uh, is where the building um, abuts the residential zone of our closest uh, residential neighbor. The remainder of the property but residential, but that is state land and presently uh, is just state forest. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything else that you need recapped as far as where, how we got to where we are now. Um, that, that, um, that, that sounds fine to me. However, I'm only, only one brain, one eyes, one set of eyes and one set of ears. Uh, does that satisfy other folks just kind of as a, as, a, as a run through of where we've been and where we are now? I think you want to clarify the changes that you moved your pumps over as well. Right. So I'll get into where okay. what we've what we've done to change since the last meeting. Um, we took to heart some of the um, suggestions that were made at the last meeting. So first of all, as I already mentioned, the building's been reduced another hundred square feet to around sixteen hundred by uh, making the building a little bit wide, uh, less wide and less deep. Uh, we moved the building back a little further from the street, and the generator that was located back here is now located out front. So we made the building a little smaller. We moved it about a foot from the south property line. Now, again, this south property line, we're, a, we're not abutting residential. We're abutting another commercial lot, as you know from other petitions. Um, so the generator now is on the other side of the building and has a, a much greater uh, setback from the uh, abutting residential. Um, in addition, we moved the trash enclosure, which was located in this area here. I'm sorry, it's hard to hold that steady. Uh, and we moved it out towards the front. So it's now the, the trash enclosure is actually located in front of the building and lines up with the uh, parking that's in front of the building. In order to accommodate that, we reduced the number of parking spaces that are in front of the building by one. Uh, we still meet the zoning requirements as far as the number of parking that is required for the site. Um, we shifted the parking. What happened when we had to, when we reduced the space because of the trash enclosure, the um, the amount of space that came uh, we came short was not enough to allow us to keep the amount of parking, but it was not a full parking space. So that allowed us to take some of the parking and move it back a little bit further from uh, the, pro the front property line. So the, there's an, a slightly increased setback along the front property line. Those are the main changes that we've made to the, bu to the building and the area around the building. Now, <clears throat> we also added to this plan, uh, which was not shown on the other plan, the, our intent to uh, increase or show some significant landscaping in the southwest corner of the property behind the trash enclosure, uh, directly ab uh, abutting that uh, property line with our residential abutter. <clears throat> As suggested at the last meeting, we considered we had we had not previously considered doing anything with the existing canopy and islands in front of the existing store. But it was suggested that maybe we could move those back to open up the space between the parking in front of the store and the fueling areas um, just north of the store. 
So we did that. We uh, took a look and we looked at a, a bunch of different configurations. We actually uh, plan on taking down the canopy, taking down the dispensers and the islands, and moving that entire uh, operation northward uh, about 9 to 11 feet, depending on what parts you're looking at, because not everything moves the same. We're changing the, the spacing a little bit, so some things move 9, some things move 11. Uh, the outline of the canopy will move also. Um, the islands that we proposed as new along on the uh, west side along the back property line, we've left in the same position as we had before because the property narrows as you move north, and it would have been uh, impossible to move that north and not make it too tight to access between the island and the back property line. Um, however, if you look at that, that, that far back lane um, actually is facing the uh, no parking area, the uh, ADA access space, and the area in front of the, the uh, trash enclosures. So there was not going to be anyone backing from that area into, the, into that um, space there. As I mentioned before, the normal design that we have from the back of the parking space to the fueling area is around 30 feet. And we're showing over 45 here. We feel that there's absolutely no problem with the amount of area maneuver space that's provided now between the parking and the fueling area and uh, the concern about cars coming out and having a conflict with cars that are backing out of parking or whatever. We feel that there's absolutely no issue there. This is not something that uh, is going to cause any kind of a problem. There's still no change to the underground storage tanks, no change to the diesel island. Um, the changes that we had proposed to the driveways are the same. We've maintained that we're, we're proposing to close the, both of the uh, driveways uh, by about 30% from where they are now. No change to the north end of the property where the uh, pervious area is now the grass and, uh, and other area that's in, in this, this corner of the property. Uh, we're not going to change that at all. Um, I know there was a concern about lighting, and I think we addressed that at the last meeting. We do plan on having um, all LED lighting. We already have LED lighting on the site. All the lighting will be sharp cut off uh, so that um, we will not have um, any uh, foot candles on the ground trespass um, outside of the, um, the property lines. Uh, to the uh, abutters, and I'm not sure if that. Uh, what it, what approvals do you need from the state? The we cut? we uh, at. And where are you at, at the process with them? Uh, hoping that we get approval here, um, we would then uh, need to get uh, site plan approval with the planning board. Uh, we've already confirmed that we do not need to go to conservation commission. Um, not having to go, that, that would be the only other board hearing or uh, other hearing that we need. From the state, the, uh, the driveways are controlled by Mass DOT. So once we know that what the layout is going to be, we will then go to DOT for access permit. It's just a driveway access permit. Normally for uh, this kind of operation, they want to review any change that's on the property. Even if we weren't changing the driveways, we would have to go to them. Um, and it's hard to say what they would require as far as changes to the driveways. And you'd have to go because you're changing the curb cut? Is that the reason you have um, to go to the state? Or? If we change the curb cut, we have to go. But if we change the operation on the site, we change the layout, we would have to go also. <coughs> any, any property that has access to a state highway and reconfigures that access or use of, uh, that's on the property is supposed to go to the state for approval. And you are changing curb cut as well, so you'll we are we are so planning on, yeah for that as well yeah okay. yeah they, they would not normally have a problem where we're looking to make them a little smaller, but uh, yeah we need to go back to them and have them review. Okay. There was another teaching. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. I'm sorry, what's the size of the current building? The current building is about 800. It's just under 800 square feet total outside gross dimension. The proposed building will be approximately double oh. that. Um, it's not fair to look at the gross area and say, well, we're going to make the sales area double, because the sales area is not doubling. The, um, the amount of area that uh, we are increasing in the store is uh, disproportionately 
allocated to storage, mechanical, um, handicap restroom, area behind the counter for the attendant, and the office for the for the um, manager. Um, we are going to increase the retail area, but I think the increase in that is somewhere, somewhere in the ballpark of 70 to 80 percent, not a double. Um, the um, if you've taken a look at some of our stores, I don't know. We mentioned that we were just we just opened a new store in Woburn, and the feeling that if you've gone into that store, the feeling that you might see when you go in there, they're not they don't sell much more in the way of the number of items, the number of offerings than we would be selling here, but the space is so much more. You can actually walk between the aisles, you can see over the aisles, and you don't feel like you're you're. Um, closed in and that's the, that's more what we're looking for here is to open it up because right now it's so tight the manager has no room the tenant has no room everything is really tight in that store and we'd like to open it up um, we want to increase the efficiency and the, the ease of operating the um, the coolers by having a walk-in cooler we can you can stack everything from the well, stack everything from the back as opposed to having to on a reach in where you have to open the door and then try to to replace product uh, by moving the the uh, newest stuff to the back, so those kind of things are really um, the main uh, increase in size. increase in the size of the store. Again, I have them with me. If you'd like to see, I can show you the elevations that we propose. We really have not changed those, other than to accommodate the slightly smaller size. It really hasn't changed the look of the building that we pre previously showed you. Is the generator going to be fenced in, or just you have it screened with that? <clears throat> with them, um, we're proposing the back of the lot. What about around the front? Yes, we do show, and I think it should say it on the note that there is a screened enclosure for the um, a gas emergency generator. That's at the bottom note on the on the side there, just above the property line. Screened of um, landscaping or screened of a fence? It would be a fence. Well, okay. uh, probably both. Uh, the the fence will not. At this point, there's uh, some landscaping we're showing here, and there's a fence that would go around the. Uh, it's just my concern is, if you have too much landscaping, too high of a fence, because the curb cut is getting, um, it's the um, the site when you come out, is it going to constrict the? Um, vision, right. The right vision? now, the, the right now the property line is about 30 feet back from the curb line on mm -hmm. the street. So you could fit a whole car length between the property line and the gutter in the street. So anything that we do on the property line would not hinder a sight line of anyone entering or exiting the property. But you're adding landscaping, so. Yeah, yeah but the landscaping is behind the property line, and, and a car right. would be sitting here so that the sight line would not be. When it's coming up, the car is not going to be sitting there. This oh, is this, the, is, this is, oh, that's right, this is the, okay. Because yeah. yeah. you have to have. There's more than a car length between, the, between where we, we, we would be doing any improvements and the, where, the car, where the gutter line is in the street. So how far is the lot line from 114? Um, I, I could get up and measure it. It's approximately 30 feet. And you have to put aside X amount for in case the state takes over. Don't you have to put it on? Um, no, that, not, there's nothing along that line now. I mean, I. I suppose in the future the state could come in and increase the, uh, a lane width or shoulder or something like that and uh, get closer to the property line. As far as I know, there's no, there's no plans or anything about taking a, uh, an additional land there to widen the road further than it is. I, I thought they were doing a 114 study while well, they've continuously been doing they, a 114 study. <laughs> but, they, uh, they might be. I mean, right now you've got um, a, a median center turn lane for lefts uh, that whole length, and there's plenty of room on either side plus the shoulder. They ha would have room on this side to add a full lane and still have plenty of room to the property line. Aren't they doing uh, work here because you're connecting to the... Um you're getting rid of your septic and connecting connecting to the sewer line. So, mm -hmm. when is that going to be taking place? Is that already done? Is it you no? Just we, to that has not been done. We'll probably do that either way. Um, uh, whether we do it, whether this project is approved or not, we would probably uh, flip over to a municipal system at some point. Either way. So right now you'd have to go to sewer um, to septic. That's right now we are in septic, but you'd we have to continue mm -hmm. on and then. The, 
we with the new building the new building sitting on top of the septic system so we would have to convert to the municipal before we could build a new building Wait, I, it's not there yet or it is, it is there there is municipal sewer in the street okay but it's not we, we're not using it we're not tied to it so it's already in place all you have to do is we have to it. run a line okay. to it yes The dispensers are moving nine to eleven feet, but the diesel isn't changing. Correct. They're just moving closer to the diesel. Correct. Okay. Is that going to create an issue for the trucks going in and out from diesel? Uh, no, we don't. We well, if we moved it more, it would. But we think that this would be a a, um, a safe move without creating any issues. Okay, I think to explain that, it'd be better if I put up the uh, elevations of the building. Basically, the building looks like it, it, it's a, um, a hip roof building, but it's actually a mansard building. So this line here is actually, if you look at it in this section here, has a width to it, and there's a, a pocket inside. So you would access, um, uh, someone would take a ladder up to here, then go up, and then they would get in here, and that air conditioning equipment would be located behind and under the roof line. So it would be in a, in a 12 foot wide pocket that's inside the, the roof line of the building. So not something that can be heard outside? Well, I can't say 100%, it can't be heard outside, but it will, it, it will be attenuated by the structure of the building. There won't be a direct line between any of the equipment and any of the abutting property. So I was asking about the refrigeration Correct. Internal or do you have no, there, there would be um, an HVAC unit and the refrigeration unit for the walk-in cooler on the roof. Uh, we do have um, probably some self-contained equipment that would be located in the store, possibly a coffin case for novelty ice cream or something like that, that would have its own refrigeration unit inside. But the, the main walk-in would have it on the roof. Uh, you mean the evaporator? I'm not sure what you mean by refrigeration rack. Sorry. Basically, the refrigeration units uh, are similar to a uh, central air conditioning unit that you would find at a residential house. That's the size of the unit. In fact, the refrigeration units for these are actually smaller than the HVAC units that uh, are going to be used to, air, to temper the, um, the airspace in the building. Uh, those units are usually only the size of a file cabinet. And um, yes, there are condensers. They do, have, they do make some noise. But as I said, that would, uh, would be shielded by the, the roof structure itself. So all that would be directed um, vertically outside, out of the, the building area. Uh, uh, can I say it a little bit differently? If I'm if I'm looking at the elevations right, the to the to the north, the front of the building, to the south, the rear of the building, and to the east, which is toward 114, entirely shields the refrigeration units or the whatever these units are called. Forgive forgive me. So the only opening then is to the west, and is that is is to the west screened in some way? Is there a, a fence on that side? Okay. 
Okay, so that's basically the pocket. The air conditioning units would be sitting okay. here. I see. So <clears throat> when you say to the west, what will happen is if you look at the property um, layout, I was misreading. I assumed that the opening, that the opening that I can see to the west is where the refrigeration unit was going, but it's actually going that would be the behind man, the door. That would be the main access. Understood. This is actually 12 feet wide, so it, I, I provide a, a three foot wide opening at one end. And <clears throat> um, if you take a look at it from this standpoint, that access is here. The, the, the overall roof pocket would be something like that, and the air conditioning units would be located there. So we do have a dormer um, at this end so that this opening actually is somewhat shielded by the dormer itself right here. This, this actually comes out, so mm -hmm. this portion of it is flat with this face of the building, whereas this top is pitched back because of the, the pitch of the roof. Understood. Anything else from the board? Okay, well, it's Ms. McIntyre, are you churning something or should we move to, uh, or, or the applicant has more to say? Otherwise, we would move to public comment. I'm happy to answer any questions and <coughs> respectfully uh, request to be able to address any issues that might come up. Absolutely. And so this opens up the public comment. If there's anyone in the gallery that wishes to be heard. And just to remind all that the process is, would you please introduce yourself to the board, your name and your address, and address all questions to the board, and then the board will certainly turn around and offer questions to the applicant in turn. Um, good evening. My name is Carolyn Castaldo. I live at 85 Colonial Avenue. Is that adequate? Yeah, I mean, that's okay. great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, I, you know, Listening to the um, proposal and looking at the plans, um, just as a side note, we did request a meeting with Prime and we did meet with the engineer, so we did voice some of our concerns and uh, unfortunately we kind of didn't come to a compromise. So um, further, these are just some of the um, issues that we're um, up against. Um, we, you know, I appreciate the fact that we want to increase the store and increase the dispensers and so forth. However, we're dealing with a lot that is not large enough in size in comparison to some of their sites. It, it, specifically, even in comparison to the Woburn site, which I've seen. So we're dealing with that right from the beginning. That, it, that we're in an undersized lot. Um, huge concern, I think, for all of us should be the fact that it's a fuel dispensing business that is not meeting the frontage requirements on 114. So you've got fuel dispensers that are very close to a state highway not even close to meeting the adequate frontage zoning requirements. Um, again, a, a couple meetings back, I um, cited a couple of state statutes regarding um, non-conforming structures, which this is a pre-existing non-conforming structure where the store is. Now we want to demolish that and make it even non more non-conforming and larger. And I mean, these are definite zoning issues that need to be addressed. They're, you know, they've been um, addressed by the appellate court in Massachusetts in 2014, and that particular um, case was Harrison versus St. Pierre, and that case was actually um, overturned the zoning board's decision because the um, actual structure didn't meet, um, it didn't pass the two um, items that are tests for uh, a project like that to be um, passed. The, um, actually, I can read, uh, the Harrison versus St. Pierre reminds us that when it comes to replacing and extending an, an existing, not, it, it, replacing or extending an existing non-conforming commercial use structure, it has to satisfy the two-part test, which is found in Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, Section 6. 
in keeping in mind, it does not matter if the change in that structure is for an improvement. The test for that, um, that particular, um, what the, the particular statute is the extensions or changes themselves comply with the ordinance or bylaws that are available in the town. So I think that we have to keep that in mind. Um, again, we're trying to take an existing business that's successful and we're trying to shoehorn a larger, a larger business on the same small lot. So I think we need to keep that in mind. The second um, part of that test is the structure as extended or changed are found to be not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the pre-existing structure. And I think when you drive by or um, look at other gas stations and you look at these canopies and the lighting, they're really bright. I mean, we've, we've driven by as a neighborhood to the um, BP and several other um, gas stations along Route 114 that are actually smaller in size, have less dispensers. And the lighting, it's, it's just, it's huge. It's a huge illumination. And it's, again, so close to the road, so close to the neighborhood. I think we have to, as in zoning, keep that in mind. So um, overall, I, th I just think our, our main concerns are the lighting, the congestion that's going to happen with having um, six pumps and four pumps parallel. You're going to have cars that are going to be coming in, waiting in that middle lane on Route 114. You've got our neighborhood exiting. That's a huge concern for us because you're pulling into the middle lane. You're either stopping or um, waiting for people to turn. And, and it's a 45-mile-an-hour road. So again, you know, that's a, that's a huge concern for us. The congestion, the fact that it's a, a business that doesn't meet the frontage, and it's a, it's, a, it's a flammable business. I mean, it's something I think that we should really consider when you know, you're looking at how close it is to the road. So um, you know, those are just some huge concerns that I think we have as a neighborhood. Um, the fact that it's difficult turning out of um, Colonial Ave as it is, and I think this is just going to really increase um, the traffic flow and we do have um, some pictures that show some of that of, of what's going on right right now with just the two four six pumps or six dispensers so I just ask that as a zoning board you take some of those items into consideration and um, think about what we're trying to put on a lot the size of the lot that the prime is on right now thank you Part, can I ask you a question? Sure. Explore with me what what uh, remind me or explain to me the, sure. the the frontage requirement that you were describing. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the frontage requirement should be what 100 feet. I mean, isn't that what we dealt with before? With oh, the setback. The setback. setback. I'm sorry, okay. and All I right. just think that that's concerning given the fact that it's a fuel dispensing business. Okay. That we're now we're making things even more congested, more parking, more cars, less um, curb cut. It just, I don't know, it just doesn't seem like a good recipe for success. It seems like a lot of congestion in a small lot. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to be heard? Yes, thank you. Hi. Wendy Kahn, 51 Colonial Avenue. Appreciate the opportunity to be heard and I just want to echo um, Caroline's comments about what is actually trying to be done on this um, property. It's a non-conforming property and what they're looking to do is essentially for profit double the increase in size in pumps and the size of the convenience store. So you're taking a non-conforming structure seeking all sorts of variances to making it a further non-conforming structure and not for safety reasons um, not for the public good, not for um, the value of the abutters, which is a residential um, property of 22 neighborhoods plus, but simply for profit. And I don't really think that that is the, the basis for the zoning regulations. I don't think that's the basis for the state statutes that require zoning for particular reasons. Um, and in, what we look at what they're trying to do on this property, we really have to look at carefully what they're trying to do. I've heard that there's a reduction in the size of the convenience store, but we have to remember what they're trying to do is not only reduce it from the original plans, but we have to look at what we have here. We've got an 800-foot structure that now is going to be doubled in size. It's going to be moved to the left of the property, which directly abuts our residential neighborhood of 22 homes. 
What they're also looking to do is increase the number of pumps from six pumps now, six pumps of regular fuel, to ten pumps. And that doesn't include the diesel pumps that are off to the side. If you drive around anywhere in this area, Middleton, um, even Costco, nobody has that amount of pumps on an even larger space. If you look at Cumberland Farms down the uh, road in Middleton, who recently redid their whole structure and it looks really beautiful, they've got much more land to do this on. They only have six pumps. They're talking about ten pumps on this little tiny irregular postage stamp piece of property and that's really not what the zoning regulations in this town speak to. Um, when we met with the engineer we had a very interesting discussion about the disconnect between how there may or may not be an increase in traffic going in and out of this area from 114 um, single lane highways on both sides and the engineer was adamant that you know if there was any increase in traffic by the increase in the availability of the pumps and the only reason people go to Prime is because the gas is really cheap. I believe a member of the board said that she goes to Prime all the time. Um, there's a lot of people that drive to Prime just because it's the cheapest gas in town. So by increasing the number of pumps, they're going to increase the availability of people to come there, hopefully with not having to wait. And the um, sell by the engineer was, well, you know, it may affect the amount of traffic, but it would only be during rush hour. Well, I drove by a prime gas station on Tuesday, October 16th at 2.22 in the afternoon, and this is what I saw. And I'd just like to pass this before the board. <clears throat> this is the middle of the day in the middle of the week, and it is congested because people are coming there. So to say that the addition of more pumps is not going to increase the number of traffic, is not going to increase the draw, is simply ridiculous. Um, additionally, reducing the driveways by 30% and increasing the availability of the number of vehicles to come to a larger convenience store with more pumps to pump gas simply creates an undeniable safety hazard. Getting in and out of Prime Gas Station right now is a safety hazard. Getting in and out of Colonial Avenue right now is a safety hazard. You increase the traffic in this property without doing anything to 114 and you are rubber stamping a safety hazard on this town and it's going to create a lot of problems because the only way to get in and get out of this structure is by the middle lane and that's crossing one lane of a public highway. So I would just ask the board to very carefully consider what is being asked here, what the ultimate effect is going to be, who is going to benefit and who is actually going to be um, to the detriment if this goes forward as planned. And I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. I do not. Thank you. Is there <coughs> anyone else that wishes to be heard? Hi. Hi. I'm Lana Gill. Um, I live in 10 Colonial Avenue. Um, the closest about her on the left of the um, neighborhood. I just had a few questions. I echo everything um, Caroline and Wendy, um, you know, said. But I just had a few questions to add. You know, I'm wondering if the store would become 24-hour store. That's my concern. And if it'll start selling liquor, um, you know, I, I just wouldn't want that to happen, you know, late night, hearing, you know, people, more noise. Um, so those two things, I just had a question. And then, you know, if this was to happen, like the construction wise, like I'm just really getting hit by a lot of construction near me. There's something happening across the street again at the Girl Scout. Um, beginning this action there. So I actually the other night I couldn't sleep because there's been construction. So you know from my end because I am one of the closest people who you know would be impacted by it. I would just want to know the you know the impact to me on you know 
if if this was to go up um, and then just some of those questions that I asked and you know I don't know if this is the right you know we, if we can ask this but somebody did buy that lot next to the property and I just didn't know if it was prime and if they had any further plans of expansion or anything that's it Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Don't see anyone come up. Would like to return? Yes, thank you. Heard, heard a couple of comments and questions in there. I imagine that you did as well. I'll try to go through it. I, I took some notes and hopefully I caught all of the comments and questions. Let me actually take it out of order because the the, uh, the last uh, abutter had actual questions, so let me just try to address those first. As far as the 24-hour, um, I think that question has come up and we have uh, indicated that we would like to uh, maintain the right to go 24 hours, but we don't expect that we would be going 24 hours. Um, we also believe that that's something that we still have to go to planning board for site plan review, and that's something that will probably be brought up at that time also. So. Um, most of our stores operate around 18 hours a day from 5 or 6 in the morning till 9 or 10 at night and that's driven mostly by the traffic and competition. This location presently does not support us being open 24 hours. We don't believe anything that we're doing here will change that and so we don't foresee any, we don't have any plans on changing the hours of operation but for competitive reasons and for future uh, operation because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We always like to maintain the 24-hour um, right if we can do that. As far as liquor, at this point we don't have uh, plans to put any beer and wine in here. We do offer it at a few of our stores. We don't have a licensing for that. We're not pursuing licensing for that. And presently the store is too small to accommodate the number of doors that we would probably need to have that in there. Um, again, we're not we're not looking to say that we will never put it in there, but we don't have any plans. It's not part of our, our layout at this point, and it's really kind of too small for it anyway. Um, as far as the construction impact, our hours of operation for construction would uh, be limited to what is normally in most towns no earlier than 7 a.m., and I believe that there might be a 9 or 10 p.m. thing. Our normal uh, construction operation runs from somewhere around 8 in the morning to around 3 in the afternoon. And uh, that's how our normal crew works. We do most of the construction in-house. We subcontract some of the uh, functions. So we might have a framer, or we might have a plumber, or we might have uh, a certain tradesperson in there. But most of the, the, uh, the activity on the site would be done by our own crews. And we would certainly live with any restriction that you have on the hours that we could or couldn't uh, actually con conduct the, the construction. We don't expect the construction of this site to take more than about 90 to 120 days start to finish. Um, that would probably be something we would do in a, in the summer time frame. So um, it would be a limited amount of time, and again, limited in, in, the, in the, uh, the duration of the day. Finally, the question was about the property next door. I know that property was under agreement previously by uh, a previous petitioner, and right now there's a sign on the property that says it's for sale. And we've been asked if that was us that bought it. Um, I talked to the owner. Um, as far as I know, and he knows, we don't know why there's a for sale sign on it. We have not put a bid on it. We don't have it under agreement. We did not buy the property. We don't have any plans to do anything. Um, it was suggested that maybe we could buy that property and change our layout to use part of that property. Uh, but we have not, we have not considered that. Um, it might have been something that we might have been able to do if something ended up uh, not being approved here, but uh, that's not our preference. Um, if we were looking to, to purchase an additional piece of land, it would not be to just simply spread out the current proposal. We would be, we would be looking to increase the size of the store or the operation or what the offerings of the store to, a, to be able to justify the increase uh, land purchase and price of that um, and so we don't we're not offering uh, or we're not considering doing that at this point 
Um, so what we're <coughs> proposing here is what we have. If this gets voted down, we won't do anything at all. Um, going back to the beginning, um, the question about the frontage, which was really the setback, um, we do meet the frontage on the property, and that's not anything that we've ever looked or sought any relief for. As far as a setback, we're not looking to decrease the setback of the existing operation. So from a setback standpoint, there's no um, additional strain or safety issues that are being uh, proposed here. The additional uh, fueling dispensers are actually to the rear and away from 114 than the existing operation. The existing operation has been that way for over 20 years, and the islands were there even prior to that, uh, the ones that you see there now. The previous islands were even in that same area. Unfortunately, it is a narrow piece of property. The property does have uh, dimensional issues. We all understand that. We know that. We're trying to um, improve the property in a way that we think is a minimal uh, impact. Um, and uh, the frontage or setback issue, I think, is really not anything that's being impacted by what we're proposing. As far as the setback to the rear, we actually are increasing the setback of the building from the existing building to the new building. The existing building is only five feet off the property line. The new building will be 18 feet off the property line. As far as setback from the south property line, we're abutting another commercial property there. In fact, the previous petition for that property showed parking right up to the property line or very close to it. And I don't think that there should be any concern about our setback of six feet from that property line, which may end up being another commercial use, particularly if someone has just bought the property, obviously, to do something with it, um, where we would be abutting another commercial use. Um, so I, I'm not sure why there would be a concern about the setback on that side. As far as uh, impact to the uh, uh, residential, we are moving the building south, which does move the building a little closer to the residential neighborhood in that uh, sense, but it doesn't move it closer to the um, zoning, lo uh, zoning line itself. We are actually increasing that uh, setback. Um, the issue on the pre-existing non-conforming, I don't want to steal, Attorney Capone is here with us tonight, and he previously at the last meeting, uh, and he had submitted a written uh, testimony as to why the Harrison case does not, in, in, in fact, is, is something that is uh, in our favor. Uh, in a nutshell, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not going to try to go through the legalese, but my uh, understanding of the issue is that in that case, a special permit was sought for something that might have, uh, that actually required variance or relief. And that the simple fact of asking for the special permit to expand or enlarge an existing use did not pr allow that petitioner to get uh, approval for that without also getting the appropriate zoning relief. We don't have that issue here. We are asking for variances. We are asking for the appropriate zoning relief from the setbacks that we need on this property. And we're not trying to do all this under a special permit as simply uh, an alteration of an existing nonconformance. So we do have a special permit portion of our application, which uh, is obviously we, ha we have a nonconforming use and we are making an alteration to it. So we are asking for that under a special permit. But we're not uh, asking solely for that to cover the zoning relief that we need. We have actually applied for a variance for that. Um, I think I've addressed the the um, the fact that uh, that it seems that we're doubling the size of the the, the property uh, or the building, and that what we're doing here is not doubling the activity in that building. We're doubling the the overall size of the building to make it more useful, more efficient, and operate in a better way. The um, congestion on the property. We feel that the additional um, and, and I, I strongly disagree with Wendy Kahn's representation that the additional pumps uh, dispensing and fueling positions mean an increase in traffic. In our opinion, the majority of the reason that people go to a location <coughs> is price. After that, it's brand loyalty and convenience of a location. 
If you're driving by a location and you need gas, you pull in and get it. If you happen to be an ExxonMobil blue die in the wool person, you're going to go to ExxonMobil and you don't care what the other brands are or what the prices are. And if you're very price conscious, you're going to go to the station that's going to give you the best price. We try to be the best price in the town. We try to offer that as a service to the community. And as you said, there are people on the board and people that are, are, are butters that use the station frequently because of the pricing that we offer. We could certainly back up traffic on 114 in both directions if we decided to go out and make gas 50 cents a gallon tomorrow. And we can certainly make the station completely dead if we decided to go out and make the price at the station $10 a gallon tomorrow. So obviously there, um, that factor is a major factor as to what drives the traffic on the site. We feel that the number of fueling positions um, allows us to better service the customers that are coming into the site. If we have a situation where um, the number of dispensers service the number of customers that are on the site, having additional dispensers does not do us any good. We've spent money on a piece of equipment that's just sitting there doing nothing. But if we're in a rush hour situation and we have people queuing up and we have four customers fueling and we have two customers waiting to fuel and we have an additional fueling uh, dispenser, two more fueling positions for them, they can fuel up at the same time, be processed and be moved out of the location. So yes, we are looking to have more traffic cross the driveway during those times when they would normally drive by because they look in and they see that, hey, all the fueling positions are full. I'm not stopping and waiting. I'm just going to come back later in the day. And in fact, that might actually cause more traffic because they're going to be coming back at some other point of the day to come in when it's not so busy. When we offer that extra fueling position, that customer can come in, get their fuel, get out, and be on their way. And we haven't added traffic on the street We've only added traffic across the driveway. Um, as far as the Cumby, I'm not that familiar with that location, but I was under the impression that it had more than three dispensers or six fueling positions. Um, I may be wrong. I was under the impression there was six there, that there was a, a two by three, six pack um, uh, installation where there's actually six dispensers and 12 fueling positions but I may be wrong I just don't I'm, I just don't know that position that location off the top of my head um, <clears throat> we had a traffic expert who um, had quite uh, considerable knowledge and experience dealing with gasoline stations and um, throughout New England and he testified and presented to the board uh, testimony and written uh, study assessment that the um, traffic on the site was not going to be appreciably increased. It sounds like when you, when you look, and I can go through the, the details of this again, uh, basically when you do a traffic study, uh, the only guide you really have is the uh, ITE manual, which is a national manual that says if you have this use, and you have this metric, whether it's a square foot of a store or a number of dispensers at a gas station, you're going to generate this volume of, of traffic. That basically works in reverse. Basically, they've gone around, they've surveyed a number of locations, and they said, this place has this amount of traffic and it has this number of dispensers, and it's only a, a, a way for someone to try to come up with some way of measuring what the volume at a location is. The traffic industry and the consultants in the traffic industry have acknowledged that they have a serious problem in trying to get a handle on estimation of traffic at a location because it's so much is, is based on the three factors I mentioned earlier, which is price, brand, and, and a location a convenience of access. And those are not factors that you can simply put into a spreadsheet and come out with a number and say, this is what you're going to get for for your traffic. So what ends up happening is it becomes a matter of experience. And based on that, the uh, individual that looked at this site for us and who has decades of experience throughout New England and has worked as the traffic engineer for the city of Boston, his analysis was that we were not going to increase the traffic at this site in any significant way. The numbers that were generated actually show less than a 1% increase in traffic um, 
at the front of the location. Um, as part of his analysis, he also looked at the traffic flow within and the traffic circulation within the property bounds itself. And he agreed that the, the uh, layout that was being proposed, the additional dispensers and the, the layout of those dispensers would improve the traffic circulation to the site and would improve the operation of the site from an efficiency, operation, and safety uh, factor. Um, I think that pretty much covers the um, the issues that were brought up. What about the overhead lights, the lights that are on the canopy? Are those going to be something that's on 24-7, or are those on, would those be on just during operation? We do not we do not operate the lights at the canopy at any location um, more than the uh, when the station is actually open for business. We don't want to mislead a customer to think that he can pull in and get gas and then find out we're closed. So the canopy lights are only open during the hours that we're open for business and that someone can actually pump gas. Um, so so long as you guys are only open until 10 p.m., those get turned off after 10? Correct, and that's the case. That's the way it is now. Now, we do have some security lighting on the property that we do leave on um, uh, for longer hours. We have um, agreed in, in talking with uh, Mr. Carter, who's a direct abutter, um, that the lighting, we have perimeter lighting usually around the building and that we would put that, uh, we would restrict that on the south and um, west side of the building so that at night when the station is closed, we, the amount of light trespass from the side of the building would be reduced from the way it is now on the existing building. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to overspeak. I didn't know if you wanted okay, to add. You're doing a better job than I could ever do. <laughs> so I do have a couple of concerns. <clears throat> now, um, you're going to have an attendant, R2, working in there. Correct. So you are, you're only, you technically only have, which is what's allowed, what's required, you have six spots. Uh, seven, I'm seven. sorry, seven. Where two of them are technically going to be handicapped in a van. Well, no, um, the um, handicapped spot, the van accessible handicapped spot is, we're not counting that as two spaces, it's one space. Number five is the handicapped space. Okay. Six and seven. One, two, three, four. So you're, I don't know where six is. Six and seven are at the other end of the lot. Okay. So I'm assuming your employees are going to park there. Yeah, well, typically we would have them, we would ask them to park at six and seven to uh, provide the better spaces for the... I'm just concerned about the overflow. If you put a Dunkin' Donuts in there, I actually travel 114 every day for work, and I do go to um, the one in Middleton Square on the right, um, on Richdale, I think it is. And I know that there's always a wait there, and there's overflow parking on the side, and there's more than five spots in the front, and there's two pumps there. But because there's a Dunkin' Donuts there, there's always traffic, and I travel peak times, I go to work at 8, come home at 5. So that's one of my concerns. I don't know where it's going to be, where are you going to put it on this lot. They do have space in that actually small lot for an overflow of parking. Okay, so certainly, I mean, it might... I know it's not required. That I mean, what's required is 7, and that's what you have, and that's it. And <laughs> But it's realistically, you're going to have more than 7 people there at a time. Okay, so... S Certainly, in my experience, I have prior to working for Prime, I worked for a civil engineering firm and did um, dozens of McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King's, um, and other uh, uh, Dunkin' Donuts, other facilities mm -hmm. that included drive throughs and those kind of operations. We are not at all proposing to do anything like that here, and we certainly do not have any uh, um, a problem with a, any restriction on any or condition on a on approval that says that we cannot offer a food service in this building that would be uh, in excess of what we're pr proposing. So there's no way that we'll have anything like a Dunkin' or Blimpies or McDonald's or Subway that would increase that, the traffic flow um, and parking for those kind of uses. Uh, we certainly don't have the room in the building to do that. We'd love to. We have a, a, a location in Wakefield where uh, we have a pizza operation that actually was on Phantom Gourmet's grade eight. Um, and we'd love to have something like that here, but um, we certainly are not proposing it to, to be at this location. Now, my experience has been at most of these locations, 
the majority of the customers that use the location are gas customers that then come into the building and they actually use the fueling positions as a parking space. That's another reason that we'd like to have additional fueling positions is because they end up getting clogged up by somebody who's actually inside the store buying a can of soda and not fueling while he's doing that. And so someone, another fueling position would allow someone else who just wants to get gas to be able to, to process. So um, we, the, the five spaces that we show in front of the building now is not untypical for our locations and we do not normally have any kind of a parking issue uh, for that type of operation. Um, I, I, you know, I, I normally find that very few people go to this location just to go to the location, to the store, not to be a gas customer. Uh, but people have been telling me I'm wrong, but, um, but that's been my general experience. I'm not saying nobody goes there just for cigarettes or just for uh, popcorn or just for a Coke, but the majority of people do it while they're also getting gas. Especially a small store like this, we have a limited um, offering if you really want to get some. You'll go to the companies down the street because they're going to have better food, a more varied um, selection. If I'm going for coffee and there's nothing for miles on down in fighting Middleton Square, I no if I was going to fight, if I had to do it Middleton Square traffic. Oh, you'd, we'd love you to come in and buy coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I get out on Essex Street, so I miss it all. <laughs> so, um, so it's just one of my other concerns, and I mean, someone you had already asked. Uh, my other question was the hours of operation, which you already addressed. What is the likelihood of going 24 hours? That one is a little concerning to me, only based off of the location that you guys are at compared to where the Barry Street apartments are and the fact that I think everything, because I know there's a little spot at the Barry Street apartments, but I think <coughs> all of that is closed down, you know, 10, 11. So I, I guess one of my concerns becomes if you do become a 24-hour operation, people running across 114 as crazy as that may be, people are crazy to get the Snickers they are dying for and they don't want to have to hop in their car because they can run across 114. Um, right now, we operate, I think, just about 70 locations and I think maybe five operate 24 hours. Um, we've operated this location for over 20 years and we've never operated it 24 hours. I don't suspect that the demographics at this location will change significantly enough for us to find it worthwhile to go the 24 hours. So in my estimation, the chances of us going 24 hours in the next 10 years is zero. But as the demographics change and if there's people coming in as we're closing at 10 o'clock at night and saying, we wish you were open a half hour later, maybe we might open a half hour later. If people are saying they want to commute into Boston earlier in the morning and they need to come in a half hour earlier because the traffic's getting ridiculous, we might open a half hour earlier. Um, but we'd just like the, the flexibility to be able to do that um, and not be pigeonholed. I, I just don't see us doing it, to be honest. I don't see it changing. Not to put you on the spot, where, where would a 24 hour store be located? Like, where is one or two of the five? Um, 24 hour stores is what I meant. Hmm? The, the one we just opened, Route 93 in Wolverine, is 24 hours right now. But I mean, that's a, that's a highway location, and, it, and I, I know if you know Montville Ave, you think the traffic's bad here, you should see that place. <laughs> I, I commute from there. I know how bad it is. <laughs> Question on the so on the, the setback. I know that when you acquired uh, the location, the pumps were there. What is this? What is uh, the if the setback should be a hundred feet with where the pumps are positioned now? What is the the, set, the existing setback that you have? Okay, so basically, in a nutshell, the setback exceeds the full depth of the property. The setback required is is a hundred feet, and the property is only ninety feet deep. So there's nothing we can do to satisfy the setback. Okay. 
And then, um, is any of the property along the road, is there any easement that the state has, or do you own up to 114? No, we own the property line presently is located about 30 feet back from what you would see as what I call a gutter line is the edge of pavement. Yeah. Um, the property line is about 30 feet in. This is the property line, this dark line here, and the gutter line is here. Okay. All right. So that, I would call that, is that easement there? That the, would be classified as some kind of an easement then? Uh, no, it's actually owned by the state or the town, or I'm not sure who, who actually owns the right of way in that area. I assume it's the state. Okay. They own up to the property line. As far as I know, there's no plans for them to take additional land. Okay. Thank but you. the state has a right to take additional land. Mm -hmm. of, I think. Oh, I think they put us out of business if they did that. Yeah, I think <laughs> probably what. Yeah. <laughs> That's the word. Yeah. That's that legal word. Yeah. Eminent domain. domain. Eminent domain. Yeah. Any other questions? from the board for the applicant for the gallery. Yeah, please. Yeah. Hi, uh, Judy Farris, 31 Oxbow Circle. Um, and I'm, I apologize for coming late. I had a, um, another meeting. And so I won't go over everything I had, but um, what I haven't heard discussed and what I don't think has been discussed is what the actual hardship is the petitioner is um, presenting. This is my understanding that in order to request a variance, they're supposed to present a hardship, and that profitability is not a reason for a hardship. So um, just to be brief, I think I just want to try to get a better understanding as to what that is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, certainly, um, this site meets the classic uh, requirements for hardship in that um, the nature of the site, the layout of the site is such that we can obviously not meet the requirements. In order to be able to, to meet the requirements of the bylaw for the setbacks at this site, um, the hardship would be that you couldn't do anything with the property which was not the intent of the zoning bylaw was, was not to uh, make a property unusable. In fact, I've, I've seen discussion that in some cases where people tried to enforce that literally, it was considered uh, uh, potentially a taking by the municipality of the property uh, because in effect you're not allowing the, the property to be used for any uh, legal use of the property, which we are not looking for any kind of a use uh, variance or uh, any kind of relief on the use, all of that is allowed in the, in the zone. We do have a problem with the shape, the size of the property, and that's why we, we have a, a hardship because of the, uh, the shape and, the, and then the topography of the property. Thank you. Is there any, nothing else, again, from the board? Um, so it would, it, would, it would appear as though that this has kind of come to a close, and so therefore that there will be a vote whether it's one way or the other at the end of this. I think what I'm going to need, I saw you making some notes, Ms. McIntyre, and I, I may ask the applicant actually, uh, based on the, the, the changes, the way that this thing has evolved over time, it's clearly very different from the notice that was noticed and for to be making a motion and therefore making a decision. I think I would ask the applicant, would you please mark this up to tell us kind of, you know, what are we finally voting on? And I'll compare yours with mine. Professor. Let me approach. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Good evening, and I hope I'm not going to be saying good morning. Uh, my name is still Anthony Capani, and my office is still located at 265 Broadway uh, in Methuen, 
And let me briefly just comment on the hardship uh, that was just raised. The hardship is not the size of the lot, it's the shape of the lot. And again, not to be repetitive, at our initial presentation, we indicated that in 1999, the Zoning Board of Appeals of North Andover found that there was a hardship. This is a general business district. The requirement for area in a general business district is 25,000 square feet. The subject locus has approximately 23,500 square feet. Pretty close, but the board found there was a hardship. They granted variances in regards to that, and I've enumerated them, and they're similar to the variances that we requested uh, in this petition. So they found that there was a hardship, but what makes the hardship is not the size of the lot, because we're pretty close to the 25,000 square feet. It's an allowable use having a convenience store and a fuel dispensing uh, station. So we, we don't have non-conforming uses, um, and, and that's important. So um, when you look at it, the, the size of the lot in its most, in the deepest part in the southerly portion is 90 feet, and it reduces down to 26 feet, if I remember correctly. So the hardship that exists on this lot is not the size, it's the shape. So we're close to the area requirement, but the shape makes it the hardship. The frontage requirement is 100 feet on Route 114. The actual frontage in this location is 390 feet of frontage. So the configuration of that lot, the board can find that it meets the hardship requirement as the board in 1999 found. So now to address your specific uh, question, I was making notes, and if you have the legal notice, I can take you through that. It'll be easier if I can just take you through that legal notice and tell you what the uh, changes would be. And Mr. Buba, please correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. Um, so the first request is a special permit. The second one is a variance front setback. The proposed setback is 10 feet. It is, the new request would be it's 13 feet. So that actually is an improvement over our initial request. So the very fir first request for a variance, front setback, we had initially 10 feet, now we've improved it to 13 feet. The request for a variance for one left setback. So the relief needed is what? Yeah. The relief needed now would be uh, 87 feet. Don't, if you correct and put a check mark next to my work on Is that my right on that? I wouldn't do that to the teacher. Yes, 13. Yeah, it's just but I will. need to ask attorney. Yeah. yeah. I'll okay. just ask, as, as we go through it, let's do each line. Just sure. like as, as she was asking, you know, to, to confirm what the actual relief is at the end of it. Each change that you've made, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so the very first variance, do you want me to read the entire paragraph? Yeah, or? That might be helpful, yeah. All right. A variance from Table 2, Dimensional Requirements, footnote 1 of the Zoning Bylaws. For one front setback in the General Business Zoning District for relocation of an existing convenience store within the existing site and add two fuel dispensers at an existing retail store auto service station. Front setback proposed is 10 feet. The new request is 13 feet. The required front setback per table two, footnote one, is a hundred feet. The relief the variance needed is 90 feet, will now be 87 feet. Thank you. The second request for a variance. Again, I'm not gonna repeat, it's the same um, uh, introductory sentence. Left setback proposed is three feet. The required, the, the new request now is 6.1 feet. The required left setback per table two is 25 feet. The relief variance needed is 22 feet. If you can do the math, because you're the engineer, that's why I went to law school. 18.9. <laughs> so the new relief will be 18.9. And we are providing 6.1 feet of setback as opposed to three feet. And then I think then the next variance, and this is the last change. At the very end, a rear setback. Rear setback proposed is four feet. That was the initial request. The new request is three feet. The required rear setback per table two is 50 feet. 
the relief variance needed is 46 feet, so now that would be 47 feet. Thank you for enduring that exercise. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, as long as you came to the uh, to the table, I, I guess I'll ask because I, this, this is one of those things that I continue to uh, wrestle with. I probably haven't put enough homework in on this, um, but we've certainly heard the. Um, you know, the gallery has made comments and Mr. Gouba has made comments regarding Harrison and the special permit. And again, uh, I, I remain somewhat uh, gray on my understanding of that. And I think we've got some new faces on the board, so it may be helpful. I know that Mr. Gouba did, did put some time into it. If you could just run through that exercise, if you could do that in, you know, five minutes or less telling us, um, you know, we've heard from, from the gallery that Harrison uh, rules here and that it, that it certainly rules unfavorably to the applicant. There's uh, oftentimes another argument. I, I will. Um, this issue came up at a prior hearing. And at that time, at the request of the chair, I submitted a memorandum specifically addressing uh, the Harrison case. And uh, Mr. Guba summarized it uh, quite well, I thought. Um, that is a 128 ruling by the appellate court, which means it has persuasive value, but it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not law. So in Harrison, it's a 128 decision, and as the board may or may not be aware, uh, as of 2008, uh, unpublished decisions weren't even uh, allowed to be argued for persuasive purposes. With the advent of discovery now, electronic uh, discovery, uh, these unpublished decisions now have, uh, have reached more, uh, more credibility now. So essentially what is allowed is that attorneys are allowed to argue their persuasiveness, but it's not a precedent setting because it's not decided by the, the, appellate, uh, the, appellate, board, uh, the appellate court in, in bank. So the case, the Harrison case, Specifically, the facts, as was related, are quite accurate. There was a similar situation where there was a gas station that wanted to improve and enhance traffic and uh, aesthetics, and they requested a special permit before the zoning board of that particular town. On appeal, the appellate court, in a Rule 128 decision, said, you, you can't do that. You requested a special permit, and then they cited a case which is a, a well-established case, and it's not a rescript opinion. It's not a Rule 128. It's Rockwood versus Snow Incorp, Incorporation. And in that case, the court clearly said, absent a variance, a special permit in and of itself would not, be, uh, would not allow the board to grant the relief that was requested. So I've highlighted that in my memo uh, to the board and in absence of variance. Now, when I first started my presentation, I made it very clear we were requesting a special permit. And then I said, when I looked at the legal notice, I said, and we're requesting five variances. And at first glance, that looks like we're requesting quite a bit of relief. But when you look closely at the request that we're looking at, and you look at the requests that were granted in 1999, they're somewhat similar. But the fact remains is that we have a request for a variance before this board. The basis of our request is a hardship, and you understand, uh, hopefully, the reason for our hardship is the particular shape of this lot. Because we're close to area, there was a variance granted on area, and it's the uh, peculiar, peculiar shape and not the size. So based on that, we did apply for the variances and we did apply for a special permit. It's my opinion and I have set forth in the memorandum that if a court were to review this, they may find other reasons why they may or may not approve or, or deny this matter, but the least of which would be the Harrison case because we did request relief by way of a variance. I have submitted that in the form of a memorandum if any board member wants. And what I also did is because when you look at the uh, 
128 decision. It's a summary. It's a two-page summary. It doesn't delve into the facts of the case. In addition to my memorandum, I actually attached a copy of the lower court's decision, the superior court's decision. I attached that to my memorandum as further evidence of uh, our position on this matter. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I think that we've gotten uh, duck, ducks in a row so that the board can deliberate unless anybody, or again, this, this is kind of like a last call, the au auctioneer is saying, you know, once, twice sold kind of thing. Anything else from the gallery or the applicant? Um, did you say your lighting was downcast? Or uh, what, can you just explain your lighting at just a tad real quick? Sure. Um, <coughs> what I mentioned is that it's a sharp cutoff uh, down <laughs> facing light. In the lighting industry, basically, when they talk about cutoff, if you take a look at the plane of the light fixture itself, the cutoff is at what angle the light can be transmitted. So we're going to have a fixture that is flush with the bottom of the canopy, and the, the, uh, the uh, LED uh, diodes will be inside that. So that when I say sharp cutoff, if you draw a line perpendicular with the ground, no light will be, uh, no glare or light from that fixture will be transmitted in any direction other than down. Nothing will go above that line parallel to the ground. Any fixture that does that is considered a sharp cutoff fixture, so there's no uplight at all. And that's just the lighting on the. Um, that will. Is that, there any other lighting on the site that would be? We would. We will do that with all of the fixtures that we uh, would put on the site. Presently, the majority of the fixtures are those in the canopy. We will have some perimeter lighting on the building. All of that will be also underneath the soffit. It will be down. Uh, it will be sharp cut off and down also. Um, and any security lighting we will uh, put on the property will also be sharp sharp cut off and then when the, the the property closes does that close those lights go off as well um, all of the canopy lighting will definitely be shut off there will be some security lighting probably that we would like to maintain just from a standpoint of of uh, making sure that the property doesn't become a an attractive nuisance okay I think I saw Ms. Khan might have had something to say in closing it Thank you. I just wanted to clarify since I have not seen a memorandum of law submitted by um, Attorney Picotti, um, but the law of this commonwealth is governed by the um, Supreme Judicial Court's um, ruling in Rockford versus Snowy Corp. And the site for that is 409 Mass 361, 1999. And that is the case that's referenced um, in Harrison versus St. Pierre, which is the rescript opinion. What that case talks about is that variances should not promote further nonconformity and noncompliance with zoning bylaws. What that case says is that variance may be permitted if the changes are found to be not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the pre existing nonconforming structures. And for example, they state that a pre-existing non-conforming structure may not be reconstructed unless the new structure is found to be in compliance with the zoning bylaws, the setbacks, and other dimensional requirements. And I would suggest to this board that that is exactly what Prime is trying to do in contravention to what the case law in this commonwealth says is impermissible by zoning laws, regulations, and the case law by the highest court in Massachusetts. Um, in terms of the lighting that was just addressed, um, I do understand that the lighting goes down. Those canopies are really high up. And while the lighting goes down, it illuminates out. And we're talking about more lighting because there's more pumps. So that is really going to light up that area, that area and extend way back into the wetlands and way back into the residential um, community that is behind Prime. And I would just ask the board to really carefully consider that um, and the decision that they're making tonight. Thank you. If I could just uh, briefly respond, and uh, essentially, and, and we yes, have we are we're at the point at which briefly is going. Okay, to right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we have a difference of opinion as to the Harrison case and Snow. What 
was left out, it said specifically an absence of a request for a variance in conjunction with the special permit. Um, that was that was the key. So what did that court hold? It said that the relief, if you're going to request a special permit to vary a non-conforming use, that non-conforming use then has to comply with the existing zoning requirements, absent a request for a variance. I set forth that in my memo, and uh, if anybody, I, I rest on my memo, and I, I feel confident in my interpretation of that case law. Thank you. Caroline? My, my question was oh, how... Come all the way oh, up, because okay. the microphone can't catch you back there. Just a quick question. Uh, it was in regards to the canopy. I just wanted to know what the height of the canopies were. Because all of the stations that I've driven by that um, have canopies that are smaller, it's very bright. I can appreciate the LED and all that, but it's really lit up. So I'm just curious as to the height of the canopies. No, it should be in a, well, I, It says matching existing. It does not actually give a number. Right, so do we know, can we have that height? Because I don't see the height, I only see the width. It says matching existing. Do we know what the existing height is? Okay. Any luck, Mr. I, I, I'm hesitant to jump in just yeah, without. I, I, <laughs> I appreciate the decorum, and at, at this point, we're just going to roll. Okay. So yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we do say match existing. The existing canopy. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Our typical canopies are about 15 feet to the deck. Um, so uh, that would be in that ballpark. That it's drawn to scale at about 15 feet. Based on the topography of the land underneath, the canopies can range from somewhere around 13 and a half to around 16 feet. We don't like to get below 13 and a half. That's usually the minimum clearance for most vehicles by DOT standards. So if we make it lower than that, we, su we subject that canopy to potential, potentially being hit by uh, oversized vehicles. So 13 and a half would be a minimum, and somewhere around 16 would be a maximum to the uh, deck. So I, I just guess the concern is now we're going to have a parallel set of dispensers closer back, and um, it just seems like a lot of lighting, like it will be extremely bright. Okay, so having done lighting uh, studies for uh, similar locations, and I, and I have done, uh, again, previous to my work with AL Prime, I was doing most of Exxon Mobil's work throughout New England and was doing, um, I probably did over 100 locations for major oil companies throughout New England. When we t typically did a lighting plan for those locations, they were looking for lighting intensities of foot candles on the ground under the canopies to exceed 100 to 120 foot candles. We are looking at for our canopies to be in the ballpark of 60 to 70 foot candles, approximately half in foot candles as to what you'd see at a typical other uh, station. Now, <clears throat> part of that is uh, due to the fact of the more efficient lighting um, and the fact that we're trying to task light as opposed to just make the place glow. So um, some people try to go out and make the canopy really bright actually put in drop lenses that have a, a bevel face to throw glare out uh, horizontally so that it catches your eyes as you're driving down the street and they use that as a marketing tool. We're not doing that. We're putting in flat lens, glass lenses that will not uh, per, uh, uh, present any glare uh, horizontally out from the station. And we're not trying to use the lighting as a uh, marketing tool at that location. So the lighting that you see at the location now is LED lighting. The lighting levels that you see in the new canopy will be similar to what you see at the canopy now. Will there be more of it because the canopy is bigger? Yes. But will it be more intense? No. I make a motion to close the public comment. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? 
So that is unanimous. We will the board shall now deliberate. <coughs> Ms. McIntyre, you often enjoy these discussions. <coughs> Do you want to lead us? No, I don't. You don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you know, for, for me, it's just the 100% relief that the amount of the relief, the, um, the amount of the variance, you know, just, I mean, I understand the property, there's nothing you can do, but you can clean it up and make the building nicer. I mean, if you don't do anything and you don't need to come here, you can actually make that property nicer without adding in those two. So for me, I have such issue with that much relief. That's my, that's my concern and my problem. And that much flow of traffic and having that small spots. And you know what? There's no way to stop you saying, hey, we can't tell, you, tell the applicant you can't put a food place here because it's not a, we're not granting it use. We're not doing that. We can't do that. So what's to stop you in two years and having a Dunkin' Donuts there? Can we not put a condition? You cannot. Okay, but reality-wise, I mean, on Scott, where are they going to put a Dunkin' Donuts? In the second bathroom? In the coffee, little, that little coffee station. You're, a little coffee. Are you kidding me? I, seriously? Do you see the Dunkin' Donuts, how small some of them are? Don't forget, those are satellite. Dunkin' Donuts are satellite. They're not, there's no bacon down there. They bring the stuff in, and everything's by a... Um, a Dunkin' Donuts is not going to set up to just sell coffee if they're not going to have a munch of a donut a little, croissant. Um, oven. Do you know how small That's they are? Look how small they are. The next time you go to J&M and get your coffee, look how small the actual I go to J&M to get my coffee, and you know what? There's no way they could even fit that small of a thing in here. I never say it. never. So. <laughs> no, That's just my concern. I don't see that happening. I agree. that, that it's, it, it would be a That's challenge to, to never say never. I agree with you on that one. And the, other, the other thing is it's awfully, awfully, awfully hard awfully hard to guard against each and every eventuality. That's why we, we have can. the tax code Correct. the way that we have it. So it's, I don't know where that brings us. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you loud and clear on. So that's my concern going into this application. So take okay. it on, making my decision. So I would um, differ a bit from that. Sorry about that. The uh, that's the beauty of this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's no getting around the fact this lot is peculiar, and I think that the applicants have done everything they can to listen to what the concerns were and have modified the plans, but at the same time trying to get maximum economic benefit out of the property. And I think that is uh, their right as a business in a commercial zone to do that. And they face a lot of competition up in Mellon 14. Uh, Med uh, Middleton area where you go. Her little rich desk. Yeah, 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 the Cumberland Farms. That's um, right. And, um, you know, I think for them to be a successful business in North Andover, they have got to be able to improve their property to do that. So I am not concerned with the variances because the variances, there are other variances there. But I think they've done as much as they can do to um, answer the concerns that were raised and to still get the economic benefit of the property. I, I know I don't have a vote in this, but my, my two biggest concerns going uh, into today from the previous meeting were the placement of the generator right near the residential property and the uh, ability to turn out of the, the, the gas pumps. Um, we spent a considerable amount of time talking about that in the last meeting. Um, and given that we haven't really talked about it all in this meeting, I think most of the folks in the room agree with me that they mostly address that issue and that there's, there seems to be enough room there. And it does not appear to differ very much if you look at the, the faded lines from where it used to be, uh, that there's not that, there's, not, there's more or less comparable turn space from what there used to be to come out of there. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I personally feel like they have done uh, what they could to address the, the concerns that were really brought before this board. Thank you for that, and just just so that everybody is uh, you know aware, uh, at this point in the deliberations phase, I'm really uninterested in who has the votes and, and who doesn't. I really want I want to hear the opinions of everybody because the, the board members and their perspectives are uh, you know as important as the applicants and the and the, and the galleries for the sake. So so don't have, please don't ever hesitate and don't qualify it. Okay. Make the rest of us think. <laughs> 
Yeah, because everybody at the table sees something um, probably that another one doesn't, or they certainly see it differently. Um, which is which is not to put Steve on the spot or <laughs> um, or Frank. Um, so, what leaving a lot of um, we didn't spend a lot of time on this one, but it was commented on. But if I it concerns me as if I was a resident, and that is while they're. Uh, I guess the opportunity always does exist for them to be a 24-hour-a-day operation as well as potentially selling liquor. And so I, I, there's already, there is congestion in that area already, and I certainly would think that um, that's something that, you know, that's what I picked up on that, uh, you know, if I, if I was, if I live on Colonial, I would have more concerns about that than some of the other areas. But there's also nothing to stop them from trying to become a 24-hour business now with the current setup either, I don't think. I don't know if altering the layout changes that fact considerably or changes that probability considerably. If you want a Twinkie at 2 a.m. at night. Well, right, but, but you may want, you could, they could sell that Twinkie at 2 a.m. whether we grant them these variances or not. I don't know if, if whether we grant it actually changes that much. And, and this is another one of those, these guarding against every, every eventuality, you know, positive or negative down, down the road is awfully hard to govern at this stage. Uh, what, what Madam Vice Chair routinely says, I'm, I'm, only, dis, I'm only deciding what's in front of me. And, and in this case, we're not deciding about <laughs> we're not deciding about uh, liquor stores or, or food service um, or <laughs> maybe food service. service. Uh, I mean, I hear everybody loud and clear. This 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 thing you could empty the entire store and turn it into a, a liquor store, or empty the entire store and turn it into a Dunkin' Donuts. There are lots of there are lots of ifs. I mean, if my uncle wore a dress, he'd be my aunt. We're not talking about that. <clears throat> so. Um, that, which is not to say don't bring it into the conversation because what that's being sensitive to is that's being sensitive to the abutters, that's being sensitive to the 22 residences that are, you know, within a baseball throw of this uh, this commercial district for heaven's sakes. So I'm not here to hijack, I'm just here to kind of comment on the comment. So this side of the table's been active. Ron? Mr. Kusha. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kusha. I agree. 100% with my colleague to the left says, okay, 100%. And I'd also like to toss out a couple of little tidbits. Even though I'm not a coffee drinker, my wife is, I see no way a Dunkin' Donuts could ever squeeze in there. Okay, I just don't see that. I'm sorry, Owen. And the other things I'd like to mention are this is a pre existing business, it's a pre existing lot. Okay? The lot next door, I said quite at the beginning of it, if we didn't grant that variance, it's like an eminent domain taking. And I understand planning board do not allow that beauty shop. This is a pre-existing, it's not a new application. That business is there, that business is running now. Okay, so we can either have the board set out a precedent to the people and the businesses and the end of, that we do not want to improve your property. I mean, is that what we want to do? Say that these people don't approve because we're not gonna allow anything? Like my partner to the left said, it's a nice plan. They've addressed everything. They've cut down on the number of coolers. They, they put uh, some shrubbery around. They, they moved the generator. What more do you want these people to do? I think they've confirmed. I think they've been agreeable to everything. And I think they've been patient through the whole process. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Ms. Jacobs. I'm not 100% happy with the building size but life is full of compromises. And I think from where they started to where they're at now, um, it's a huge improvement. I don't think anyone's gonna be happy in this, unfortunately. I, I hate to be the bearer of that news, but grant, don't grant. It's pre-existing. And I think the fact that it's pre-existing, so I think it's, you know, I was more understanding to the people who were furious about Barry Street because that was beautiful open land, and then all of a sudden it becomes apartments. This has been here. The lights have been there. The lighting's probably worse now than what it may be. Wink, wink. Um, <laughs> so I think that does create value. When these people bought these homes, I they bought these homes, they knew that gas station was there. 
I it agree. wasn't a surprise. And I think, Just like the people at the airport. They buy a house near the airport. It's not a surprise that the planes land. And I think that that has a lot of weight on certain aspects in the sense that you have to understand that people are, a business is going to improve. And I don't think it's wrong because anybody who owns a business, you don't do a lot if you're not getting a profit out of it. Um, not a bad word. So I don't think that's, I don't think that's wrong. Um, and my hope is that maybe this will improve it. I, I do hope that I don't put my foot in my mouth and five years from now they're 24 hours. Um, but, And as far as them selling liquor, that has to go before the board of selectmen. And that's not going to happen. And that's not going to happen. <laughs> all right? So all well, people, no, I'm still. I know it is. It's going to be a liquor store. It <laughs> goes before the board of selectmen, and that's not going to happen. I see I'm going to be on the board in five years. There's so. even less shot of that happening than Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> okay? So with that, Frank, I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm not going to ask you to say anything. But if, <laughs> if, if there's anything that you're interested in offering, then by all means, please. Enjoy the floor. We haven't even introduced you yet, which we'll do at the, at the end of the session. Um, but just you're well, still I, here. I, I think the existing uh, building and site is a little bit of a eyesore. I think this is some improvement to that. Uh, I, well, I I recognize there may be some uh, increase in traffic, and there's a concern on that. But I think it's already kind of congested there already. There's lots of times. So well, thank you. And uh, I think we've said an awful lot up here. I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to offer anything um, different than it's already been said. Um, but other, but I but called in everybody else, so the least I can do is offer what my thoughts are. Um, and primarily, uh, you know, I fall on the the Ron and Allen side of things, which is that this is a commercial district. I think I said it in previous hearings. This is a commercial commercial district. This is a, an, an ongoing business concern that's been here, uh, you know, an awfully long time, longer than longer than the the residences nearby, and that that's weighty to me. Mm -hmm. um, the, the what's similarly weighty, however, is the neighborhood comes to the table and says. What you're doing is amplifying whatever the negative impacts are of this commercial um, enterprise. Um, if you're growing that commercial enterprise, now all of those negative impacts are amplified. There's going to be more light. Hear you loud and clear. Whatever the studies say, I hear you loud and clear. There's going to be more light. Can it be controlled? Is it is it something less than what is standard out there? The the 60 candle, whatever they are. Yeah, I think that. I have every expectation that AL Prime um, can and would or could mitigate that. Um, is there going to be more traffic? But, you know, I, I sit here and I say, you know, a traffic study by the applicant, of course, is going to be supportive, otherwise they wouldn't bring it. Mm -hmm. Common sense to me says that if you're putting more pumps in, if you are expanding the sales floor, even if it's, even if you're not expanding the offerings, if you're making it more attractive, there is going to be more traffic coming in and out. And then I sit up here tonight and I says, do you know, that absolutely right. If I'm driving by Prime and I'm going to get gas and there's a queue, I'm already on the road. If there's a queue, I'm gonna just keep driving. I'm not gonna get gas today. So I'm already traffic. So it's not changing, it's not changing my behavior in any way. So perhaps there's not going to be a traffic impact. And I, I shake my head and say, you, you know, even if there is um, a, 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 an amplified traffic impact. Once again, this is a, this is State Route 114, and this is a commercial district. It, the the planners, the people who said that this is a commercial district, have said we want more business. So, the the traffic impact to me is, is it, it goes it goes both ways. Um, so it's really hard to reconcile, and so I've got to look somewhere else for ways to make a decision. And again, I keep falling in the the Ron and Allen camp. Um, I know that there, as sure as I am sitting here, there are going to be negative consequences to the, the colonial neighborhood, and those are not necessarily uh, negative consequences that I sit here and, and embrace and am running to. Um, on the other hand, in the balance of things, I, I, I just I can't get away from the gravity. I mean, it's it's just like an impossible. The gravitational pull of a black hole just says this is a business. This is a commercial district. 
These are residences that are abutting a commercial district. Nobody is surprised here, to borrow your phrase, Alan. <clears throat> um, um, nonetheless, I, yeah, I'm drawn to that, and I am also like so sympathetic to what the neighborhood is, what is happening around the neighborhood, between Berry Street, between uh, Bobas or Babas or whatever it is, between all the stuff that's coming up at the mouth of your neighborhood, Many would say, and not the neighborhood clearly, and I hear you loud and clear, if I lived in that neighborhood, I, I would probably be putting as much time and effort into these hearings as you all have. Uh, it's something that I admire, respect, and certainly do not envy. I came here, I'm a vol volunteer, but you guys are, are beyond um, the community engagement elements. Um, so I, I, I don't know how to reconcile all of that stuff, except to, I, I continuously fall back on. I've said it over and over again because I just, I, I can't escape it. So what's in the plan? And what's in the plan are things that give me heartburn. And I've said it over and over again. I think I said it at the very first meeting. I've said it at other meetings. I cannot believe that I am sitting here looking at a single digit setback on the south end of this property, whether it's a residential or a commercial district, six feet gives me heartburn. <clears throat> I look at the, uh, I, I look at the site and say, "Gee, gee whiz, I better I better take a tums because there's not a lot that people can do with this pies, this wedge of a property where you really can't. There aren't a lot of ways to move pieces around. I mean, I I hear that loud and clear, having sat at not in this chair, sat in that chair, in that chair, uh, <clears throat> having sat on this board for so long." I mean, we don't see these wedges all the time, but when we when we do see them, we recognize them. Like, well, this is this is another one. This is going to be awfully hard to not suggest that there's a hardship, and and there there clearly is with a hundred foot setback on a ninety foot property, impossible to get by. A wedge that goes down to twenty six feet that's awfully tough to get by. Uh, but but again, six feet. We started at three feet, if I remember right. So you know, has the applicant moved in the direction that I want? Yeah, by a hundred percent, they moved from three feet to six feet. You know, am I patting somebody on the back for that? Not not really. Um, but it's it's something. It's an applicant's willingness to move things around, moving these, um, moving the the pumps around, you know, coughing up another nine to eleven feet is a very big deal to me, frankly. Um, I'm not suggesting that it's dispositive. It's not the thing that pushed me. Uh, pushes me over the edge or anything, but it means a lot that the applicant is willing to move structural things around in order to accommodate the thoughtful commentary of both the gallery and the board members themselves. The applicant has similarly worked with the board and the commentary by shrinking the store size. Did I gasp when they're moving from an 800 square foot store to a 2,000 square foot store? Yep. Am I excited about a 1,600 square foot store? That's a, again, we're at 100% increases in, in, in things. No, I'm not excited about that. Um, but in, oh, the eyesore. Was, was, was that you, Frank, said eyesore? No, but boy, a, that 1,600 square foot store sure is gonna be nicer than the 800 square foot store that we've got right now. So once again, in, in, in balancing things, <clears throat> It's, you know, it's a little bit of sugar to help the medicine go down. Um, I am equally appreciative of the, of, of the relocation of the generator away from, oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your, your name, Mo moving it away from the residential, uh, res residential uh, property. I'm not excited about it being as, as prominent on 114 um, as it is, but once again, it's a commercial district. We're not putting a, uh, you know, we're, we're not putting a, a Picasso sculpture there. It's, it's a, it's an AL prime. Um, <clears throat> so I think that is the extent of my commentary and the way that I have thought about this thing. Um, share, I share your concerns, uh, Ellen. I certainly share some of the enthusiasm that I've heard from this side of the table. <clears throat> I share the, the, the. The thoughtful amplification of the of the, the consequence, the negative consequences that the neighborhood has has shared, um, and I'm uh, cognizant of the improvement both in the property and the business. So, in the in the context of something beyond the 
several hundred yards one way or another up and down 114 in the context of the community that drives to and through this area to, to buy gas in North Andover to buy a cup of coffee <clears throat> or, a, or, a, or a Diet Coke, whatever it is that people get at 7 in the morning. Um, this is, this feels, this looks better, it looks thoughtful. Um, so I'm, I'm generally supportive of the effort and supportive of the application. Um, so that's not of a lot of comfort to the folks on Colonial, except to say that no matter which way this board goes, and I'm, I'm not crystal clear which way it's going, frankly, um, but there's, there's, there's more, more public process to come. If I was hearing folks right, and this is going to the planning board next. Uh, I, I do not envy either the applicant or the neighborhood for uh, putting them through another series of hearings, um, but it is another opportunity for the neighborhood, if it's successful tonight, it's an opportunity for the, the folks in the neighborhood to uh, exert some, some more control over this if the planning board is inclined to approve it, which, I mean, they, they didn't like the, the beauty salon next door, so it's entirely possible that they're not going to be excited about uh, the, the prime. So I guess I'll I'll probably shut up and something else you want to say or you want to get right to a motion? Yeah. You want to give me the thing to read? Yes. <laughs> Jump on that. Do you want, it? All right. do you want me to do it, my friend? Or? Well, okay, well, if you do, I mean, I thought it was my job, but you're more familiar with it. Yeah. All right, so I'll take the special part. Um, with that yeah. said, are we all done? Is there, is, is there a motion? I make a motion to... Uh, I think I, if she's going to read it, then uh, Ellen will make the motion. Okay. Do we have to close that? Uh, so we're all. Um, so I'm going to start with a special permit first. So, and because there's a reason. So uh, I'm going to make a motion to approve the special permit in accordance with section 9.1 non conforming uses for alteration and extension of a pre existing non conforming lot and structure. The applicant is present to alter the pre-existing non-conforming land and structures in order to re relocate the existing convenience store to a new location and add two fuel dispensers and reduce the width of an existing non-conforming driveway by 30%. And I am going to reference um, plan submitted by Anthony Juba, am I saying it right? Juba, sorry. Revised 1031C-1.0, C-1.1. A-1.0, A-2.0, A-3.0, and I'm also going to re reference <clears throat> the um, environmental service submitted by um, Anthony Goober, I'm going to say it again, on June 31st, Gillian Associates tra Traffic and Packing Specialist submitted on July 19th, uh, Technical sub submitted on August 27th, and John Gillian's uh, resume, as well as Harrison versus St. Pierre. Attorney Capone's memo. Attorney Capone's memo dated. It's not. Look on the second page. It's not dated. You didn't get a dated. memo? I did date it. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid the law was going to change. Well, it's a copyright by Thomas Rivers, so 2018. <laughs> And that's a special comment. So, motion made. Is there a second? I second that motion. Motion made and seconded. We will, it, it's uh, Valerie, we're at the, the vote is being staffed by the regular members, right? It's yes. the five regulars. Yeah. So, we'll start with the regular members. All right, in favor? Aye. 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 No. Aye. Aye. Okay, so Aye. that's four in favor, one opposed to the special permit. So I'm going to go with the variances, and um, I'm going to references all, reference all those again, and I'm not going to repeat them, so because I just referenced these, what was submitted as well. So the, there's going to be five variances. The first one, a variance from Table Two Point. Do I have to say them all since uh, since they were all said, or do you want me to, as we revise in the meeting? Yeah, that's that's, that's, well, all right. that's no, no, that's fine because we're just going to drag it into the okay. into the decision. So, so the uh, five variants that we discussed in the meeting that was uh, revised, um, I think the four and five had no change, with the revisions done to one, two, and three, as noted in the meeting, and I'm referencing the other um, 
information as well, the same information. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Motion made. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. Did Ron beat him to the punch? No. Yeah. Ron. Ron. Ron beat him to the punch. Now we'll take the the call, the roll. Ron. Aye. Yes. No. No. Aye. Aye. No. Aye. Aye. Four ayes, one opposed. The variances pass. That is, that is just for that matter. Thank, thanks everybody for their time, their patience, and their efforts. Good luck at planning. I was just going to say good luck at planning. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, one question that I have with point of order is on the Mylar. Do you want us to wait till we yeah. go through the process yeah. and then? I don't know. Because the Mylar's changed from the initial submittal. Yeah, you can hold on. Okay. Do you want an urgent? I can't make the condition now. I don't think it makes Without the Mylar, it's not legit, right? So they have to give them the Mylar at some point. We actually have some discussion about it, I think. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Any change would be after this hearing, anyway. All right, so with that, the, the balance of the uh, agenda includes uh, item number five, the acceptance of the meeting schedule. Uh, Valerie, the only change that I'm going to need to make is, is the, October. the October meeting. Yeah. yeah. So. So, and I also actually have some changes oh to my. application what? deadlines. I should be, I'm uh, sorry. Um, do you want to do? Do you want to do the week before or the week after? I'm I'm indifferent. A week week before would be better. Probably uh, yeah, October first. Yeah, I think 1st. so. Too. So October What is it? October what? Is it October first. Okay. So why why the change to October? I have a standing board meeting the second Tuesday of October. This month actually got canceled, so we didn't have to. Didn't have to. <laughs> no problem. So change 10-8 to 10-1. I'm going to send you out a new one, but we're going to change it to October 1st. So for me, the application deadline, that column needs to be 2019. That's just a revision because you carried over 2018. So I see. That's why we have Ellen, because she notices yeah. things. And then the right. holiday, you have a deadline on a December 25th, which I is know. a holiday. So, so I talked to, yeah. Do you need to change that as well? Sorry. No, 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 wait a minute, wait, wait, see the deadline. Okay. You mean 24? 24. You mean the 24? Legal notice publication dates, you can... Uh, it's 24. It's December no, 24. the very top, at the very top. Yeah, I oh. talked to Suzanne oh, yeah. about that. That, she, I, we talked about that. She, that's like the actual legal, but she said it can be published like the day before. So yeah. you might want to clarify, is it going to be the day before or the yeah, day I, after? Yeah, we, I told him we'd bring it here, but when we talked about that, yeah, because there's no way I'm going to obviously be spending out legal notices on those two days, because that won't Correct. work. But yeah, I could either do it. Um, neither will legal trip. Neither will the trip, you're right. Um, yeah, so we can adjust those. All right. So the, the, I just want to be clear, the, um, you were suggesting moving the October meeting next year to October 1st? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I can attend that as long as that's after sundown. That should be after sundown because that's the end of Rosh Hashanah. Okay. Isn't Scott 30 hours after? In October? Yeah. yeah, it should be. It should be, I think. But that's, that's just my only stipulation. October 2nd is a holiday? Uh, no, uh, October 1st at sundown is the end of Rosh Hashanah. Okay. Oh, oh, because it's up with the first show. Sorry, I think I have to pull out of the show. Okay. So we're going to change the legal notice pub date to December yeah. 20. Well, I'm going to just double check with Suzanne. Whether you go up or down. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. All right. I prefer to go before because I'm not going to be here the 26th or the 27th. On the second. <laughs> so. Um, okay. And I'll change it to 2019. So are we going to keep October 1st? Are we still good with that? Fine with me. Okay. Again, change the 19th. Yeah, I wrote yeah. that down too. Yeah, sundown should be at 6.30, so that should be fine. I was going to say, isn't it? Well, it's on the website too, but, well, I have to. You can always take a day off too. Well, no, it, <laughs> it doesn't work <laughs> that <laughs> Why can't you do that? He can't have an excuse of the meeting? Oh, yeah. He, he beats. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Oh, uh, okay. I thought you were talking about the excuse for service. No, 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 no. Oh, my God. No. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I see that from here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, I would not attend a day if that just didn't work. But I just wanted to clear what was. I totally agree with you. Thank 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 you.
Well, can we what? No, 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 no. That's not the next item on the agenda. What's the next item on the well, agenda? Well, if you would look at the agenda, you know what the next item <laughs> on the agenda is. We just did meetings. Yeah, and so what's next? We're not doing minutes. They got postponed. We got, yeah. That was at the beginning of the meeting. To the, I thought you said proposed to the postponed the, the end of the meeting. Yeah, next meeting. Next meeting, okay. Next meeting, yeah. All right. All right, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll wait my turn. Oh, she. So, uh, uh, you know, it's been a, it's been a long-standing concern of the board whether or not folks, well, that's not fair. It's, um, Ellen has <laughs> routinely uh, insisted that uh, applicants be bringing mylars and men bearing the expense of mylars, and um, that has inspired me since there were a number of applications, particularly the special use for the daycare center most recently, for which why would, uh, on, why on any, any sense of creation would we need a mylar for the special permit for the use of a daycare center, uh, you know, on, uh, way up on Osgood. So I corresponded with, uh, with Suzanne a little bit to say, where, where is the origin of the requirement for mylars being submitted to the board? And there's, <coughs> hey, you like that? And there doesn't, there's, what I was concerned with is, um, you know, is it in, is it in MGL somewhere? You know, is it some standard that, that we as a local board have zero authority to, or interest in changing, and so therefore we'll be filing up applicants in the future. Uh, it doesn't appear to be an MGL, it just appears to be in our own um, rules and regulations, the board's rules and regulations. I'm sure that there was a need for them, uh, you know, way back when, when technology was what it was, or where applications might have been what they were, but in, in today's, um, in the practicing world, and, and speaking with uh, both Suzanne and certainly uh, you know, one of the attorneys that comes before us, over and over again, he generally, you know, they have said, they each have said that we don't necessarily, we don't need mylars. As a board, there's not a, a compelling reason for us to get them. We can get them on a, an eight and a half by 11, eight, eight and a half by 14, 11 by 17. You know, they can come in in any, in some other way. They don't necessarily need to be, you know, the, the pretty penny that mylars cost. So with that, what we're, what the only thing that I suggested talking about tonight was to bring up that that has been an issue, to suggest that there's been a little bit of legwork suggesting that we don't necessarily, as a board, we don't necessarily need them. Folks may individually want them, you know, if, if folks have some affinity for Mylar or tradition or whatever that is, then by all means, now it's time to talk about it. Otherwise, it's something that I would suggest that uh, we approach with a rule change so that the applicants aren't unnecessarily, um, that we're not waiving them some, for some applicants and sticking it to other applicants and that we would have a standard um, that we don't necessarily don't need mylar, but we would keep the flexibility and say that at the board's discretion, it could require a mylar. So here's my thoughts on that. You just said that it might be at 11 by 7. That you might you need to be consistent on what you're requiring. So doesn't something need to be sub submitted to the D? The, um, doesn't a register of deeds? Register yeah, of deeds. Yes. Eight well, and a half by 11. What we heard mm -hmm. what we heard from the practicing attorneys is that the registry is not, does not require mylar things. Mm -hmm. So is that only in our? That's what the con the conclusion has been. Yes, that it's only in our, sure. our local. She read our whole bylaw. Am I, am I, I don't, sure? I don't. I'm going to have to look. I didn't look. I did a search in our bylaw for mylar. That's nowhere. Do you know what? I'm going to take it. Stated where it is, right? It's in our it, our rules and regs. Oh, okay. She didn't say where. So, as a yeah. board, do we have the authority yeah. to change our rules and regs without without approval from yeah. the um, so, selectmen? Yep. We, ju we just did it two months ago regarding yeah, the vote. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. So before yeah. you make it, you're just saying with special permits or just just special permits or just and variances? I, I I honestly haven't All looked, looked, looked oh, okay. at the rules. Oh, we're just discussing. We're not doing yet. Not right now. No. Oh, okay. So, so a while are more durable and lasting. Yep. Do we uh, paper copies don't always last? Do we instead have electronic copies, which would be more permanent copies? Well, the the, the uh, I think everything is digitized. I, I was going to say once a, like this hearing after it closes and the decision is done, everything gets laser fished into it's all you know electronic. You don't have them it, provide you uh, with electronic copies and. Uh, we are going forward. Media format versus now, scanning them? I have to scan them anyway. Because we, yeah. sign, we sign them. Yeah, I have right. to scan everything okay. anyway, but... And the Registry of Deeds does everything electronic now anyway. Yeah, if it goes to... Well, well, that was a concern that I had. Yeah. Everything there. there. What's, so, yeah, what's required require with the right? registry? And that's why, that, that's why I was suggesting the discretion element, because yeah. the, okay. the recorded side of land, I, I believe, doesn't have a mile requirement. The registered side may. 
And so um, what, I would, what I would suggest is just as a rule, we don't need, the board is not requiring mylars, but applicants to the extent that they're going to be recording it on the registered side perhaps, then they're gonna bring in a mylar anyway because they've got other, I mean, other rules to follow. If I may ask, if, if an applicant submits a mylar and the meeting's done and it gets scanned, does the mylar just get thrown out? No, not, they'll come, so after label, well, they didn't have an updated mylar, but typically yeah. what was supposed to happen today is that Paul and Ellen are supposed to sign the mylar, and then after the decisions are in and the 20 days is up, they come pick up the mylar and the true attested copy of the decision from the clerk's office. They go over to the registry of deeds, they record it, I can't forget how much it costs them, and then they come back with a paid, this is a real one, but they'll come back with a copy back to me. So what happens physically to the original Mylar? Does it get... They take it and it goes to the Registry of Deeds. I don't get do, that back. Do they, the the applicant takes it right, right, right. Right. and but, the Registry but, yes. keeps it. Okay, and, the, and the Registry it. physically stores it. Yep. Okay, so, that's, so, it, so it would be physically it. stored if... You know, that, that's, that's a fair question. But, Things have changed. Now there might be there might be like a 90-day period and then the registry destroys oh, the original that, documents, yeah, but, but it's all, yeah. the registry is digitized. Right. And, and the, re the reason I'm asking up. this is, is that, you know, as, as Frank said, like the entire reason that you would have a Mylar is so that it lasts a long time. Yep. If the document is never going to last beyond the point at which it basically gets scanned in yep. to, to the Registrar of Deeds, mm -hmm. then like the physical durability of the mylar is not necessary. Understood. And, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, agreed. And even if the physical, if the physical, you know, if the durability of the mylar were necessary, then you know all of our decisions would be on mylar, which is you know an, an absurd kind of extension of the durability argument, which is not the argument you're making. Right, not, right. Not, not describing that to you. So anyway, that's get rid of mylars. Get rid of mylars. Or at least don't require them. Alexandria. At least don't require them. Just I, be consistent with. You know, you just can't have, uh, my issue is why aren't you allowing them to have it when you have everyone else and it's part of our rules and regs. So I am a rule follower, Amen, believe sister. it or not. <laughs> I do like my Kinda. rules and regs and I like to kind of follow them. Your kids follow your rules as, uh, yeah. as, as much as I yep. do. Like as Every single them. one. <laughs> my oldest creates new rules. You're as, as adamant as you are here. Yes. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> you have the rules posted on the refrigerator? She probably does. <laughs> Ellen doesn't go on the internet at work, which cracks me up still. I do not. They got rules. No, but she follows them. That's what I do. Exactly. Well, they've got watchers. You know, the server is watching what you do. I'm sorry, could not offer. All right, so mo moving on. Yeah. The last item on the agenda is miscellaneous chapter communications, which we just say that's Can terrific. Can we yeah, wait and moving this to like, a, like for the next yeah, what do you, yeah, there, I mean, what do we do? There's no movement. It? It's, just, it's just conversation. So there's no movement. What, I'll, what I'll do next is I, I will likely draft a, oh, okay. a, a, a rule change, right, an so amendment. Just so I know what you're right for. Um, should we inform somebody at Chapa that oh, Mr. Manzi is going to have? Look at this detail over here. She's like, yeah. you. Bernadette. Yeah. Go get them, girl, right? Go get them, girl, right? For some reason, they're very slow to, yeah. Can we start returning them if they don't? call them twice, so I remind her again the other day, so hopefully it's the next one. I come to an accident. They might also want to take a look at that CC. Not that that would be circled that as well. Okay. What's Chapel? Um, the Citizens Housing and Planning Association. They send us notices. 40, 40 B rights of first refusal kind of notice. Affordable housing kind of notice. So part of an agreement, a 40 B agreement, is we have the first first right of refusal. The town has money put aside to buy affordable housing, so we have that right to do it or not. Oh, so this board. We get notified. No, the, 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 there's an affordable housing trust uh, board that deals with that okay. part of it. So, <clears throat> so what have we, I mean, I, I, I can see, you know, if it was inappropriately addressed and so on, but so what are we, are we agreeing? Are, I mean, it, it, no, we're just, we just get, we just get notice. We're just being kept in the loop, essentially. Yeah. So the town, the, the town has decided, has chosen to buy, and therefore they will, uh, they will sell. This or or open market. market. I don't know if the it's not, not it's not the, not the, the, the town has just been so. notified. But the town has first right of refusal. Right, 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 but they haven't refused yet. Did you hear that? And that's no. what I'm trying to you understand is we're right. just being notified we have first right. Um, I guess Who says do we want to buy it or not? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the, the town, the, the selectmen. Yeah, it's not a, it's not our authority to exercise okay. the right. We're just, again just being kept in the loop. That's all. Okay. Yes, we're the, um, the, the, the zoning board is the primary. It's the only board that hears the 40B. And so, yeah. 40B. And so therefore the communications come to right. us as well. Although, although we really don't have a lot of it. The, this board, the zoning board, doesn't have an interest generally in the operation of the of the housing project. But we get the I don't know if you okay. I mean I know Lord they're dealing with it right now and trying to figure that out, but, um, but and, yeah. the, and then the very last item of conversation is to welcome Frank to the board. Frank is our, our newest welcome face. Frank. He showed up Sur surprised the heck out of Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things are surprising me these days. But Frank is a welcome surprise. A lot of games. Now it's like a I know, I'm so tired. Make a motion to adjourn. This is There's your the one. Five seconds. Oh, we yes. back. He said that locked and loaded. All in favor. Aye. 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 All opposed. I'm waiting for the right time to sneak it under. <laughs>